we're so glad that you were able to join us for this Arkansas Kids Count Coalition event. Um, something different from what we do sometimes. It's a town hall discussion on the school year that just ended last month. So we want, uh, you know, we know that the year was a challenge and, you know, even historically a challenge. We, uh, so we want to hear from all of you about what, what you think went well, what the struggles were, uh, what your hopes are for education in our state as we begin to come out of the pandemic. We've invited a few guests to help kick off the discussion uh, before we open it up for all attendees in the second half of the event. We want everybody to be able to share your take and ask questions yourselves. Um, so be thinking about what some of those might be. Um, and we're so let me uh, just introduce um, a few of our guests this evening. We're happy to be joined by all of you on the call. Um, and we have uh, Casey, uh, let me see if y'all want to wave when you, is Casey on? Casey's not on yet, but okay, you can okay. introduce her. Okay, I'll introduce her um, uh, and y'all will know who she is when she comes on. Casey Forche is a principal in El Dorado and uh, Jen Goodwin, if you want to wave, uh, is an attorney at Disability Rights Arkansas and Angela Davis is a music teacher in El Dorado and Beatrice Valera, she works with students who are English language learners and their families. And Tiffany Pion is the secretary of the Arkansas Parent Teacher Association. And last but not least, we have Ben Cotillo, who is the executive director of Forward Arkansas. And um, as I mentioned, uh, and as Rebecca mentioned, this evening we'll be talking a lot about challenges that students and parents or uh, guardians and educators faced while we navigated school during the pandemic. Um, but we wanted to start by asking the six of you um, if there were positive surprises during this school year. That might be a nice note to start on. Um, how about uh, Angela, as a teacher, um, do you have something positive that you can think of that you'd like to share with us? We'll start with you and then I'll go around to the six guests. Um, Angela's not on yet. Oh, Angela's the okay. one who's not on yet. <laughs> Casey's, Casey's just joined us. Angela's not on yet. Okay, okay. Casey Forche, if you want to wave, um, is a principal at El Dorado, and we were just saying that we wanted to start with, uh, with a positive, on a positive note. So um, I know that Ben is on. Ben, um, as a reminder, Ben's the executive director of Forward Arkansas. Would you care to answer that, Ben? Um, think about something positive that came of the school year. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, and this is, um, you know, of course, this is my perspective and, and what we saw uh, in our experience. Interested to hear um, the educator perspectives as well. But a couple, of, a couple of positives. I mean, it all depends on how you look at it. Um, a couple of positives from my perspective. First, I think um, the pandemic, how hard it was. Uh, you know, how hard it was for teachers, principals, I think it really um, kind of re-emphasized uh, the importance of educators, um, how tough their job is. Um, and I think also, um, you know, hopefully, um, you know, I've certainly seen this kind of uh, elevated or re-elevated the level of respect we have for educators uh, and the role that they play. Um, so that's one positive. Um, I think another positive we had, um, you know, I came on board at Forward during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, part of uh, the work that I did, um, you know, part of what I did when I first started was, was just really had a lot of conversations around the state with superintendents, with principals. Um, so probably had 40 or 50 of those conversations. Um, and though, Though it was, I mean, the pandemic, you know, I can't even imagine the pandemic forced folks to think to the, you know, to, to kind of re rethink everything they were doing down to the smallest detail um, almost overnight. Um, but what, you know, in a lot of these conversations, a question we always ask, you know, what, what are some successes? What are some changes you made? And in every case, um, 
And then we also asked it in follow up to that kind of what will you continue to do even after even after the pandemic, you know, that you that you wouldn't have done otherwise. I think in every case, um, again, it was it was incredibly challenging, but in in folks kind of re reexamining, rethinking kind of every everything that they're doing, they identified new and better ways to do a lot of things, um, everything from school drop off to staffing, you know, certain staffing structures, scheduling and things like that. Um, so I think there were there were positives. Uh, and, and that is honestly testament to the educators who, you know, were innovative and committed. Um, but I think, you know, one positive that emerged is a reexamination of some of those things, identification of some better ways to do things big and small, um, you know, that can be moved forward. Um, that, yeah, that's a really good point. You know, the struggles sometimes um, help us innovate, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, certainly the parents, uh, so many parents I know agree with you about the new respect that they have for teachers, yeah. um, especially that, you know, spring of 2020 when the whole state was shut down, all the schools were shut down. I, to a person, all the parents I know um, talked about how hard, <laughs> how hard it was and how much they uh, appreciated the teachers for all that they do, that they were doing at the time and that they had always done over the years too. But yeah. Um, so, and I, it, uh, Casey's on now, right? Uh, Casey as a, as a principal at, um, is a principal at El Dorado. So as an educator, um, would you like to add something uh, positive that has come of this last pandemic school year. And if you're on and talking, you're muted. I'm sorry, I, I, I wasn't quite catching the last thing. But, uh, oh, do you want me to repeat? Oh, okay. Do you want me to repeat the question? Okay, I didn't know if I was supposed to be speaking to someone else because I keep. Um, the I we were hoping that you could share something positive um, that, uh, from the school year. If uh, but if your Zoom is going out, we may move on to the next person. But let me know. It sounds like Casey's connection might be bad. So um, how about we uh, talk to Beatrice next? Can we, uh, Beatrice, I'll remind everyone, uh, works with students who are English language learners. Um, can you talk to us about something that you saw positive come of this year? Absolutely. I am, uh, I work at the Little Rock School District uh, here in Little Rock and my position is the ESL coordinator uh, multilingual office. We actually, what just happened with Casey, I believe, is what happened to tons of millions of teachers that had to learn how to teach online. Uh, the Zoom wasn't working, the students didn't know how to adjust the volume. And in the specific case of our English learners, they didn't know in many, many cases how to charge a computer, how to turn it on even. So, but you're asking me for positive. We had extreme resilience from parents that became teachers. We had uh, a good percentage of the population and not necessarily ESL. Also, uh, all kinds of parents reach us because I work in the administrative area and they reach us out for help in how to teach their kids. Uh, they were scared sending them to school. So the positive part was the fact that families get together in education and educating their kids. The second thing that I can, the second major positive thing that I can think of is the technology use. Uh, I have a good part of teachers that are traditional, like, or are convinced that traditional education is the best, would not use technology You in our, um, masters and teacher education programs, we say technology is very important, but if you traditional education educator, you say, well, I'm not gonna need that. Well, it was primary importance 
uh, that you learn. Uh, in our case, we use Schoology, but there were Google Forms and Google Doc and Google Classes and uh, all kind of technology, new software that and teams that we had to learn uh, that you had to. It was no option. And the third positive thing is that because we have so many kids in virtual classes, we have less kids attending and um, for our population, the attention, the one-on-one -on -one on attention increased for the ones that were attending. And even though the positive is consequence of the negative, for many students that were attending with masks, especially in the high school level, uh, they, get, uh, they get more uh, attention from teachers because they, they had, um, in many cases, the students that register virtual in high school level, they did not attend. So they have more opportunity to deal with the in-person kids. Um, that's, thank you so much. Um, something that you just said, I, I think is a perfect description of the year for so many participants, uh, which is the term extreme <laughs> resilience. I think we all had to kind of uh, have extreme resilience to get through this year. So um, thank you for, uh, for that. Um, and uh, let's hear uh, next from Jen, who is, a, a, as a reminder, is um, a, an attorney at Disability Rights Arkansas. So what's your positive take, Jen? Okay, I was just going to say just how fluid everything seemed to be and how not only did the teachers and administrators in the schools immediately jump in and come up with ideas and plans for the masses of the students, but I um, represent kids with disabilities and most of my children are on IEPs and all that sort of stuff. So they have individualized education plans and they were having to come up with plans specifically for each individual child for that case too. And I was just amazed um, both from the school perspective and how great they were to remember that they still had obligations for these kids and these kids still needed the special services that um, were in their IEPs. And so most of them jumped right in and still found ways to provide all of that. And also on the other side of that, most of the parents that I represented gave grace where they needed to. And that was something we were talking to them about at the beginning of the school year too, was give them some time, you know, it's, it's new for everybody and we don't wanna, we don't wanna um, flood the system too bad. We want your child to get the education and the care that they need certainly, but we do have to have a little grace in this situation. This is something new that no one's ever dealt with before. So those two things. And then also just the technology that a lot of our kids wouldn't have had otherwise, that now they were given a Chromebook to go home with and maybe they wouldn't have had any form of computer at their house before and those sorts of things. So. Those are some of the positives that we saw from our angle. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, definite flexibility was a, another theme for the year and being able to roll with the punches. I appreciate that. Um, let's, uh, how about Tiffany um, with the Arkansas Parent Teacher Association? Do you have, uh, what, what would be your answer to that question, Tiffany? Um, so I'm a teacher at Little Rock School District, and I'm also a parent of a high schooler, junior high, and two elementary students. So I kind of got to see both sides of it as a parent and as a teacher. And a lot of what I saw both um, in both cases, and my children do not go to school at Little Rock, they actually go to Rosebud, so we're in two different districts, was the amount of communication. Because there wasn't the ability to just run up and go into the school. Um, and so my son, who is in special services, we had more communication because we would text or they would call or they would email, whereas before we would get the notice in the mail and you would go up there. And since that wasn't a possibility, it seems like there was more communication. And as far as a teacher, at the same time, being in pre-K, the, the parents bring and pick up the child from the classroom. Um, since they could not do that this year, we had another way to drop off and pick up, which shortened the amount of time that we had with each parent. So we began texting, calling. We actually used a program called Seesaw for communication. And there was a lot more quick communication that could occur instead of waiting until the end of the day to have the conversation at the door. Um, and so I think that would be the biggest thing that I saw was the communication being so much stronger this year. 
Oh yeah, that's really good. Um, thank you for that. Uh, talk about necessity being the mother of invention, right? We had, we had to uh, get really, all had to get really good at communication. Um, so um, Tiffany, would you mind, um, since you're uh, just we're just talking would you mind um fielding the next question um which is uh how do you think that the as a as a teacher and as a parent um how has it impacted your approach to education um and you covered that a little bit already but just um in terms of in those dual roles that you have um as a teacher one of the biggest things with the PTA, because I was the PTA president at one of the element, uh, one of the early childhood um, centers, and then of course on the state board, um, was trying to come up with ways that we could engage the students and parents without having to be in the school. Um, so we did a lot of virtual field trips. We did a lot of Zoom conferences. Matter of fact, our convention this year was um, also on Zoom. And so we had to start kind of being inventive of how do you get businesses involved with the convention even though there's nobody in person? How do you get parents involved with PTA even though you can't be there in person? Um, and then as a teacher, it was kind of the same thing, trying to figure out how to engage the students even though we couldn't go anywhere. Um, and it's a little bit different because I teach three-year-olds and we cannot go on a bus anyway, but we usually bring the field trips to us. We couldn't do that this year. So we came up with ways where we would either video chat with another uh, occupation or something like that or we did the virtual field trips with them as well and then as a parent it became very important to explain I guess what my child needed especially having my disabled child normally I can go in I can talk to the teacher um, but this time I had to do it all in words either via email or phone call and so it became very important for me to completely let them know what he needed as a student along with my elementary and high school student. Thank you. Yeah, no kidding. Um, uh, we, I think that Casey, uh, the principal at El Dorado was able to join us by phone. Is that right, Rebecca? Okay. Um, so I was going to ask Casey um, about the biggest challenges of running a school during the pandemic, but since you didn't get to answer yet um, the question about the positive, you could sort of um, pick one or the other or, um, or separate those if you'd like, but um, if you're able to unmute yourself and, and uh, join the conversation, um, maybe think about answering the question of what was the biggest challenge to run a, run a school during the pandemic. Just All right, good evening. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Thanks for joining all us. Right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I definitely want to start off with a positive. Um, this year, I learned about the, resi the resiliency of not only the adults and the staff and my teachers, but also the students and their families. Um, I deal with a very high risk uh, population in which they already have so many barriers that are set against them already. And I learned that that if we can get through this, we can get through anything. And so we definitely learned some new strategies and some new things to do in the classrooms and some new things, some different uh, techniques and ways of teaching. Uh, so that better help us in going forth. And there's some things that we still continue to use even you know, after the pandemic clears. So I, I just, uh, I want to commend, and, you know, everyone throughout the state just for the resiliency that we've shown and, and for keeping them engaged, um, because I know it's definitely difficult. And that leads also into uh, one of the biggest challenges, I think, especially for the teachers, was the hybrid teaching, uh, trying to teach virtual at the same time as you had your live students there uh, in class. And so I think that was definitely um, a big challenge that we faced, and also just keeping them safe. Um, I always say my biggest responsibility, first and foremost, is keeping my students and my faculty safe, because if the students feel safe in your environment, then they're free to learn. If they're not safe, if they don't feel safe, if they don't feel protected and feel that you care for them, then it's not a good place for them to be. 
And so definitely uh, just keeping them safe, you know, with the PPE having to be worn and the sanitizer, which we should be doing anyway, but, you know, with the different quarantines and staff being out and having to cover and having to cover when the students were out. So it definitely uh, created a big challenge. But again, uh, I'm excited about it and, and going forth that, like I said, if we can make it through this, we can make it through anything. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I, not, I know that you were having some technical difficulties and I wasn't sure if you heard um, Beatrice say the uh, term extreme resilience, but you sort of echoed that too. And um, I certainly think any complaint I had during the pandemic would have to pale in comparison to, to anything, any challenge you faced uh, running a whole school. So thank you so much on behalf of all of us uh, who care about education for, for all the work that, that you did and the challenges that you and your staff and your um, whole school family um, met. So thank you so much. Um, let's uh, hear next from Jen um, with disability rights. Um, you know, we've heard we heard with the move to online learning uh, that some students who have disabilities were not receiving the services that they were supposed to. Um, I was wondering if you heard of cases like that um, and were or what were some of the common concerns that you heard from families uh, with children who have disabilities? Yes, definitely. So a lot of my kids um, have one on one parents involved in their school days. And so they weren't receiving those um, during virtual learning. And a lot of times people were like, oh, well, that would be impossible or whatever. But I saw a lot of my kids that did still have their one on one para with them versus my kids that didn't. And it was a night and day difference. So that was a big challenge. And that they, you know, they were to receive it per their IEP and um, they just weren't doing it. They weren't receiving that para. And so a big part of that too was that whenever they got ready to actually transition back into the classroom, all of a sudden the school didn't have anyone available to be able to allow that child to come back. And so then there was a delay in them getting to come back into the classroom or there were problems you know, with that parent not knowing the student, you're halfway through the school year or whatever the timeframes are versus the kids who had one still designated that was working with them virtually every day um, and, you know, they were at the school or they were at home or wherever, but working with our students virtually. And then whenever they transitioned back into the classroom, that pair was able to transition back with them immediately. So it just made for a smooth transition. But a lot of our kids did not have that service. And then several of our other ones um, weren't receiving or a lot of our kids are in more rural areas and they don't have Internet access. And so and they don't have it already within their home. And so they didn't have the internet access and they were being told to just go sit in a parking lot somewhere and there would be internet available. And that's not really feasible for a lot of our kids with special needs. And so they have a lot of extra concerns that's not gonna allow them to just sit in a parking lot somewhere to get online. And so they needed a little more than that. And so to the credit of the schools and the state, um, a lot of them were given hotspots and were allowed to use those at home, but there was a pretty big delay in that for a lot of our students too. So those are some of the challenges that we saw um, on a regular basis. Thank you. Um, yeah, and it was a slow buildup, right? I mean, pointing out all these challenges and then finding ways to meet them. And um, hopefully we never have to use these skills again <laughs> that we learned, but uh, hopefully we won't have anything else like this. But yeah, it took a while, didn't it, to um, realize what the gaps were and then try to get those folks to fill, to, to meet the needs of the kids where they were. So yeah, the, some heartbreaking stories of kids trying to learn on a phone in a parking lot. So thanks for that um, reminder. We'll add one more sure. piece to that too that I just thought of. Um, also, a lot of our kids weren't able to meet their goals that were on their IEPs, and so they were looking at needing extended school year services or um, something like that just to allow them to get caught up from being behind, and maybe they didn't get the pieces to their IEP that they needed to be successful this school year, and so the end of this year has been trying to navigate getting um, some extra services over the summer. And then our kids are going to go to school over the summer and trying to find all of those services during summertime as well. So that's just been another challenge to go along with that. 
Yeah, um, let's talk about that um, summer, uh, the possibilities and opportunities this summer to catch up. It seems like so, so difficult to get it all ramped up in time, but um, if you can, you want to think, think about that one and um, other folks on the call can think about that too. We can discuss that just a bit later. Thank you for that. Um, Beatrice, uh, working with students who are English language learners, do you think, uh, do you, I mean, do you think that the online learning programs met the needs of students whose primary language isn't English? Um, for example, what were some of the major needs that you saw for students and families that you worked with during the pandemic? You're muted. I'm not sure if you're talking yet, but you're muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, similar to what Ms. Gouin was saying, our students don't have an individualized plan, but they have uh, for their education in the classroom, whether it's virtual or in person, they should have some modifications, educational modifications to that includes uh, use of dictionaries or uh, maybe extended time for quizzes or uh things that we add in their plans for them to, uh, to, to make sure that their needs are attended whether the student is in level one or level three we have from one to five uh, so that that affect attending them properly because uh, when teachers were attending their classes in person and virtual using the computer and having kids in there it was really hard for them to modify uh, there was also there were also uh, situations uh, with the testing, the federal standardized mandatory exams, where the students had to take it uh, in on campuses, uh, whether a student was virtual or not. And as we know, the results and the data that we receive back, many of the results are altered in so many ways because these exams were taken at home, and we even though there were affidavits and uh, uh, legal, legal uh, paperwork issued to parents who say this is a test that your students should take in an isolated area and this and that. Uh, in so many cases we have data that is uh, controversial or, or opposite to what we have records previous data for the students. So therefore if this student is scored too good in the exams they're not going to receive services anymore. So we try to we try to deal with the parents explaining that the best case scenario is for the student to try their best in, in a situation that nobody expected. Um, we also offer in the Little Red School District, uh, like also what Ms. Goon was saying, we had, uh, we offer Wi-Fi through several companies that were giving discounts to families. So they reached the Wi-Fi, we gave Chromebook, we issued Chromebooks to the families. And we also facilitated hotspots, the city of Little Rock, uh, facilitated uh, those boxes. Um, many, many families were able to obtain them and use them. Uh, we always have the issue that if it's more than three or four users, they needed another box, but yet the counselors were on top of uh, following up the families that needed either extra help in that regard in, in, in Wi-Fi or, or, or help with the, to pay, not to pay the bill, but yes, to give them access to resources like like I said, Comcast was one of them that was offering discount for the students, and sometimes were free if they qualify according to their uh, to their income levels. Um, we also have programs, ELD programs, which is English language development, in addition to the ESL program. The ESL program, what it does is place these kids with a specialized or trained teachers that are gonna teach them. Uh, in a, a specific way, uh, small groups, extra time, and certain attentions and strategies that are, we use SIOP, uh, that's our uh, platform. But um, if, if with this ELD program, we did extra support to the kids, uh, especially those kids that were coming like in 2019, 2020, only one year in here. We need to place these students in ELD because we, we couldn't test them. Remember that we didn't have the most important test was the ACT Aspire, and we skipped it. <laughs> and then we didn't have any data. And that was uh, a little tough for us to place the students. So what we did is offer this program and then evaluate the need, the further need 
to extra services or maybe less services in many, many cases where the student have, was coming from other state and we place it in the program and then ELD will determine, well, this student will need more or less. But basically, yes, uh, we, we have to watch closely our results, the few ones that we have. Uh, because in, in many circumstances, uh, when the students data was coming from their homework or their participation, the teachers have to learn how to sync their grades in, in new software. So we, we really had to wait a little bit, a bit more patient in evaluating the kids that we have never done before. It was, it was completely new for everyone. But yes, those programs and those approaches help us to see where we were. Of course, the first two months we were clueless. We didn't know what to do. Uh, translation is not the solution uh, in the state of Arkansas up until last month. Uh, we did not have bilingual education approved and, and it has been approved. Uh, but yet the Little Red School District uh, uh, is trying to train. We have an ESL Academy and the ESL Academy train teachers in the state of Arkansas to become specialized in these strategies. This year, the Academy was free. <laughs> it has never been. So that's another positive outcome that I, did, I forgot to mention. Uh, a positive outcome of this because the money that uh, schools are receiving to, to overcome so many issues has helped us. And right now we have, we never have a waiting list of teachers trying to become certified in ESL. And this year we have more than an excess of maybe 200 teachers that didn't find a spot in the ESL Academy. So those are great news. Oh yeah, that is really good. Um, yeah. A lot of interest, and yeah, we were really pleased um, to see the positive uh, take from legislators on the on bilingual education. Whereas it has always been something that they didn't support. It really uh, kind of sailed through the legislature this year. So I think there, hopefully, that's a recognition um, of how important uh, meeting the needs of kids um, whose second language. Um, is English and also all kids who need to learn another right. language, no matter which yeah. one they yeah. started with. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. And some of the things that you mentioned, you know, the lack of data and the, you know, troubles with testing and that kind of thing are going to be long term uh, impacts that we'll see. Um, and so we wanted to talk to Ben um, as a reminder, Ben's with Forward Arkansas. Um, y'all, y'all look at education um, kind of at the system level across the state. Um, so, so Ben, what do you think will be the long-term impacts? We've already heard some of them, but what will be the long-term impacts of the pandemic on education in Arkansas? It's a big question, but uh, yeah. maybe we can start with a small bit of it and delve into a little bit more. Yeah, I think in some ways it remains to be seen. I think there will be many impacts. Um, the two, you know, two of the biggest, um, you know, that, that I am concerned about, you know, the one that, that we talk about consistently statewide is, is you know, uh, and across the country is, is student learning loss. Um, and, you know, we kind of really won't know what the extent of that is for some time until we get some, some you know, more better data. Um, but, you know, I'm, I expect and, you know, all predictions, forecasts, you know, expect that that, that will be significant. Um, and um, you know, unfortunately, as as happens in most cases, it, it'll it'll um, there'll be an outsized impact on you know those kids that that were struggling already, um, uh, and in families that were struggling. Um, so you know, there is the potential for you know long term kind of learning outcome and economic, uh, I guess, outcomes you know, for, for kids potentially. Um, I mean, I think it can be addressed, um, but I think, you know, that, that is one of the, the, you know, the biggest potential long-term impacts. Um, the other, I, you know, I think a lot of, uh, a lot about are really the social emotional, uh, impacts of this year on kids and families. Um, just, um, it, you know, ex uh, extreme isolation, extended stress, um, uh, certainly for students, um, but then also for parents and families in many ways. 
Um, and that, you know, that added stress on parents further impacts uh, students uh, and, and the, the, you know, the stress they have and feel. Um, and I think, you know, data, data show, you know, uh, increasing impacts of that, of what's gone on this year. Um, but I do, you know, there are some, some um, hopefully longer term positive impacts too. And that is, <clears throat> I think the pandemic, you know, the inequities and a lot of these challenge, the challenges already existed before the pandemic. They were exacerbated in some ways, um, of course, but I think it did, the pandemic did shed light on some of these challenges um, and inequities that, that we face in our state and in, in education. Um, and in some ways, I, you know, I think, again, some of this remains to be seen, increased kind of political will and increased, um, um, uh, you know, energy around solving uh, some of these challenges or addressing them in a bigger, more systemic way. Um, so, you know, some of the, uh, you know, some of these, again, on the, on the social emotional needs, um, you know, that's a huge one. I think it, it shed, you know, shed light on that. Of course, it exacerbated it. Um, but also, you know, well before the pandemic, kids were struggling and, and have, you know, a range of, of, you know, social emotional challenges, needs, um, and, um, and if those aren't addressed, you know, kids can't effectively learn. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, hopefully a long-term positive impact. And we see, you know, a little, you know, some of this at the state level is an increased focus on addressing that, uh, in a more, in a more systemic way and ongoing way. Um, another, uh, you know, huge challenge as we, as we know, and I'll talk about, um, during the pandemic was, you know, technology and broadband access across the state. And that's a, it's a huge issue um, in, in Arkansas and, and a huge kind of, a, a huge uh, inequity. Um, um, and so, um, you know, it shed, as we all read, it shed a lot of light on these things and how bad it is and who is being impacted and um, what those inequities are. Um, uh, and, you know, as a result of that, in some ways, um, there is more political will, there is more energy towards solving those things. There's hu huge in inflow of resources being brought in to address some of those things. But I think the real, um, you know, the real kind of challenge, or it's, a, it's a, a critical point in time because it's how we um, kind of take those lessons learned, take that energy, take, take that, the, uh, you know, the new light that was shed on these things um, and, and kind of sustain that and moving forward and really see that these, that some of these, you know, systemic challenges and inequities are addressed and um, uh, uh, solved and that the resources, um, you know, these huge kind of one-time uh, resources flowing into the state are used effectively to address address some of those things. Broadband is one, you know, it's a it's a huge challenge, um, uh, really challenging and complex. But you know that one in particular um, needs to be solved. The resources um, are, you know, have have the resources I think are there. Um, but uh, it's, it's you know, going to take a lot of work, energy, focus, uh, and attention to actually get, um, to actually address that issue and, and, and make sure the people who need it most get that access. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good reminder that um, the, we had these inequities before and this exacerbated those inequities, but if we do it right, uh, we use this lesson and the light that was shed on it to um, make to bring those solutions to the table, and the, we maybe we have more political will. So, um, uh, really good reminder. So, thank you. Um, unless Angela has joined the call, um, Rebecca has Angela. Okay, um, so we've covered our uh, initial round of questions with um, our invited guests, and uh, as and I and if you weren't on at the beginning of the call, I mentioned that. 
you know, this really is a town hall. We want to hear from you. Um, and so we know that many of you on the call are parents and teachers yourselves or uh, care about the education system. So we want to open this up for discussion. Those questions were just sort of to get us primed and we'll um, ask those folks some more questions too, but we want to make sure that we um, that we open it up to y'all. As a reminder, we're recording this and we'll put the recording up online later. Um, but if you have questions or comments, you can unmute yourself or you can uh, type a question into the chat box. Uh, we'll, the staff of advocates will be uh, monitoring that. So um, I'll just ask if there are parents and guardians here on the call um, what has the past school been school year been like for you and your family? Uh, if you are interested, if anyone on the call is interested in sharing that, um, I'll kind of try to look and see if anybody unmutes. It's not quite as easy as in person when you can just um, raise your hand. <laughs> Laura, <laughs> can I speak? Please do, Patricia. So. Um... One of the things that we've noticed in talking Sorry, to the parents Patricia, we you, work with. Will you introduce yourself uh, oh. and just so people know who you are? I know who you are, but. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm Patricia White and I work with Arkansas Support Network. We are an agency that works with parents and enables parents to uh, be their child's best advocate and also work with the students to teach the students how to advocate for themselves. We're a nonprofit uh, that work, we work under a grant through the US Department of Education. And so we work with a lot of parents that have children with disabilities. And I think one of, the, one of the things that comes to mind that we saw a lot of is that the parents didn't understand the technology that was coming into their home. The, you know, particularly for children with special needs who, um, as Jen, I believe it was Jen pointed out, were not receiving a lot of the services that they needed a lot of that one-on-one -on -one speech therapy, occupational therapy is very difficult to do over the internet. But then the parents also did not know how to connect you know, to these services or, or how to work the different programs that their student was required to use. Um, and you know, this, some of the schools were trying to teach parents how to do that, but if the parent doesn't know how to operate the computer or get onto the program at all, then it makes it very difficult for the schools to reach out to the parents to teach the parents how to teach their children. And then you had a lot of burnout because the parents were overwhelmed with trying to just take care of the day-to-day -day needs of their student, of their children, and then add the, the education that the parent isn't primed or isn't ready. I mean, they don't know what they're supposed to do. So that we, that's a lot of what we saw. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, that's really important. I mean, all of us definitely struggled to figure out the technology early on and probably continue to. So I, um, it, I can't imagine um, doing that uh, in that situation. So um, thank you for that. And um, yeah, as a reminder, you can ask a question in the chat or um, unmute yourself and ask a question or add a comment to that if you have a, an answer to that question, which was just about um, what it was like this school year for y'all. And um, be th I don't see anybody unmuting right now, but um, or a question in the chat. So uh, for now, um, oh, state, uh, yeah, I see a hand up. Is that Stacy and friend? <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, my name is L Leron McAdoo, and I am a 27-year educator in the Little Rock School District. And, and so uh, uh, four things. The first is we found out testing or the lack of standardized testing didn't kill anybody. No one died. And, and, and so we, and, and being an educator uh, and being an art educator, as well as uh, someone who does career and college preparedness for children, I recognize colleges more and more are looking at portfolios and less and less about test scores. So I think that is a reflection we need to take heed of. The second thing is options. 
Now there is an a, a inkling in our mind of a virtual option. How can we best use a virtual option for those that this will actually work for? Because that leads me to my third thing. As I talk to my children during this time, some of them actually needed this break from people. You know, and you have to be mindful that we don't want people to be recluses or hermits, but but sometimes that opportunity to reflect, that opportunity to stand back and just, just deactivate is a good thing. And some of my children, believe it or not, and it actually kind of shocked me because I thought everybody would be biting at the bit, but that that is something that we need, reflection time. And, and the fourth and final thing is, this is a great opportunity. I am so happy that you all have this forum because what I have not seen, I, I happen to be married to the forever 2019 Arkansas Teacher of the Year, Stacey McAdoo. And I have 27 years myself, right? So uh, what I have not seen is anybody say, educators, what were you, what was your reflection? Educators, what can you contribute to how we move forward in this battlefield, I say, called education? So those are my four things right there. Testing, options, reflection, and let's not make this a missed opportunity. Excellent points. Thank you so much. I love that Stacy also has her own hype crew too. You've, you've said that before. I love that. <laughs> um, thank you so much for those excellent points. Um, and Jacqueline has her hand raised. Would you like to um, ask a question or um, chime in? And if you unmute, unmute yourself first, please. Thanks. Okay. I think the last question that I, I remember you asking was, um, as parents, how we felt about the school school system. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. What has the past been been your like for you and your family? Starting off, it was very, very, very challenging because I work at a college, and then I had three children who were attending the Marble Elan School District. The oldest child was doing a uh, dual, so she did her junior and senior year in one year. Then I had uh, eighth grade and third grade. So having to come home, do my motherly duties, and then make sure that their assignments were done. I was appreciative of the fact that I could log into their Google Classroom and see what needed to be done, what hadn't been done, what had been done, so I could keep, keep track of their progress. And at the same time, I could communicate with the teacher to say, okay, what are we missing here? You know, what are we lacking here? Okay, she made this grade on this, this, this. Okay, what are we missing? You know, I was grateful that I had the opportunity and the channels to communicate with the teachers. Also, as far as, as teaching them how to advocate for themselves. Prime example, my, my oldest, um, something was going on with, with, her, with her assignments. And so I told her, I, she said, Mom, I can't do it. I said, well, first thing first, uh, did you communicate with your teacher to say X, Y, Z and let them know what's going on? And that's step one, you know, so teaching them how to verbalize and communicate with their instructors and uh, still get, still number one, still be respectful, you know, and to get the information that they needed to proceed on to do what they needed to do. So like I said, at first it was very stressful, but then I knew that I had to keep them on the schedule as if they were actually in a classroom. So we can't sit up to 11 and 12 o'clock and be on games and be on Facebook and be on XYZ. We need to get our rest so we can get up. And by the time I get home from work, I need you to have at least attempted to do what was presented to you. And then I know where to pick up the pieces or I know if I need to text uh, Ms. Ms. Jackson and say, hey, uh, I'm, I'm stuck on this. How can I help you help my child get this done? So it was, it turned out to be, be okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think so often in the news, we see reports of parents who are just sitting over their students on Zoom. And um, we don't hear quite enough, I think, from the parents who are at work and coming home to um, the result of that school day. So thank you for, thank you for that perspective. 
Um, and I think that Beatrice wanted to add something um, after the last speaker before. Um, go ahead. Uh, yes, I had the opportunity to know Mrs. Stacy McAdoo, and she's just wonderful and forever co uh, collaborator for the district. Uh, I'm mentioning, he was saying, uh, Mrs. McAdoo, I guess, he was talking about the importance of uh, the break that the kids have from being in the classroom and the uh, uh, creation of new avenues for technology for kids that didn't know that they liked it. Uh, the Little Rose School District just opened an initiative called Ignite Academy, Ignite Digital Academy, and now we are offering K-12 uh, elementary and secondary level uh, a digital academy where the students that function well in that environment have the opportunity to take the school year. They have to have a commitment for a year, but if they decide, especially in the high school level, so many kids uh, had the opportunity to stay at home and perform better than in the classroom, like he was saying. Um, now they can register, get their credits, and graduate online if they wish to. And if they don't want to, they can come back and the district is uh, guaranteeing that they're gonna have a seat if they decide to come back. So I think it's a great option that it was created because of, because of the need that opened up after the pandemic and uh, we saw the results, like he was saying, so many families uh, struggle and so many families decide to do in person because it's, it's better for them. But so many other families express their content to be taking classes online to their own time, being able to submit their assignments until 12 a.m. every day that somehow help many others, especially in the high school level, we have the tendency, especially in the ESL uh, uh, population, when they when they reach the 10th or the 11th grade, they want to work. And not only that they want to work and counselors uh, advise against or, or in favor, but sometimes they have to, <laughs> sometimes because of the conditions they have to. And so many of them had the opportunity to graduate yet um, uh, doing online. So just to support what he was saying, I think that the families, some needed a break and some took advantage of the break and now they can continue in the Ignite Academy, which is uh, the latest um, opportunity that uh, Mr. Poor and uh, two principals uh, uh, have created for the kids. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity um, to, uh, we still want to continue our discussion, but I, I want to take the opportunity to introduce y'all to our new education policy director who's on the call today. Um, and, and Rebecca introduced her earlier, but for those of you who've joined, um, it's Olivia Gardner. Um, and I think that uh, Olivia wanted to ask a couple of questions too. I'm gonna um, turn it over to Olivia, but she's our education policy director who just started on staff last week. So I know uh, we look forward to all of you um, getting to know her and working with her. Hi everyone, it's so nice to be here with all of you. Um, as Laura mentioned, I'm the new uh, education policy director advocates. Um, one of my, uh, you, you, um, you all were touching on this question a bit, but I would like to, to still ask this and, and open up the floor for more reflection on this issue. But do you think there should be a mix of online and in-person options moving forward? Um, a yes, in the chat. And then, uh, so, sorry, go ahead, Beatrice. Uh, in the Little Red School District, you can do either one, uh, but uh, there will be uh, schools where the hybrid option will be uh, offered. We we are trying to, uh, like if you do, you have to do a commitment and you can finish, you can do hybrid, but you have to commit to certain specific time uh, to complete certain credits because, because just organization issues. But I, I, I actually believe that the hybrid model is how it's called. And we also opening new academies like West uh, uh, Innovation, which is a school of innovation that is opening new uh, courses such as uh, agriculture and uh, 
uh, related to, to, to new areas that the district never explore and in the CTE areas that, my God, are fantastic if they can uh, do it in that, in that format. But definitely you have to register for either one, take the commitment, finish those uh, uh, credits with that commitment and then you can move to the in-person or online. Great, thank you. Uh, I saw someone, um, or Patricia White put in the chat that this will allow um, children who are homebound or with serious medical needs to continue their education. And I think that's a really important point. Um, does anyone else um, wanna add? Oh, uh, Stacy McAdoo. Yeah, I was gonna say two things. One, I do think that it's, it's needed in order for children to just still be able to compete globally and with other school districts. But I also want to remind everyone that we are, we're not past the pandemic, like we're still in the pandemic right now and our numbers are going up um, every day. So I think that it is a very viable option, not just for students, but I also think for teachers. And we know that our students, the younger ones, are not even able to get the vaccine right now. So it definitely is an option that is still very much needed. Wonderful point. Yes, thank you. We are not quite over this hump as much as we would like to be. Um, Tiffany, I see your hand raised. Um, yes. So being in pre-K, um, we did not have the option for our students to be online. And really, it would be hard if they were. Um, originally, we were going to have the option and it was decided later that it would not be available. Um, but because we spend so much of our day with social emotional learning, it would be a challenge to try to do that in a hybrid situation. Um, and so I know that was one of the reasons why pre-K was not chosen um, to have online school. But then as a parent, I have one child who did stay um, on the online school all year long. And for her, it was amazing. She was able to actually go farther then her classmates and the teacher would give her assignments that were maybe next week's assignments. And she was able as a senior to actually finish early because of the online portion. Um, so I kind of see both sides of it as a, as a parent and as a teacher. And I do think in the older grades, it is a very nice option to have, especially for those students who either work faster than the, their um, other uh, their friends, um, or that may need more time than their classmates. Great, thank you. Those are all great points. Um, I think that um, I'll ask uh, another question, which is um, the State uh, Department of Education has hired a group to conduct a study on how the pandemic has created or made equity gaps, gaps worse in education. Um, how do you think the pandemic may have impacted equity in K through 12 education for students with disabilities or students from families with low incomes or um, black indigenous or students of color? And again, you can uh, put your response or ask, uh, you can put your response in the chat or you can unmute yourself or raise your hand. Beatrice, did you want to add? Looks like you're unmuted. Yes, I was waiting to see if anyone. No, okay. <laughs> uh, it, the gap has widened up uh, immensely for us. Um, I, I'm sorry, and I apologize for saying uh, for the English uh, English as a second language population because of their conditions, they their uh, the technology lack of technology and the the cultural uh, changes that imply to go into virtual. Um, I think that we did a great job in uh, educating parents. We created Parent University with the help of several departments in the district. And once, uh, maybe well, it was probably once or twice every two months, uh, they attended to classes and how to Train the, train the parents how to how to navigate how to, uh, the the teaching of our kids, but mostly uh, using the computer. 
how to check their grades, how to help them with homework, where to find additional resources, how to uh, text their teachers or email their teachers. Uh, I think that at the beginning it was uh, harder. Now we're in a better shape, but I think that academically the data has shown that the gap has widened up. Uh, and again, uh, the, the testing was, uh, is delaying probably the real results because I think that the parents were very resilient and many of them learned how to navigate the system. And for those who did, now they're looking at the virtual option as a better one than the person in person one. But since it was a year and the first semester, they were completely lost. Uh, and only then, teachers, teachers also have to carry on with new policies and new uh, warnings and new the, the issue of the mask it is incredibly hard. If, if you are a teacher in here in this school, it's incredibly hard to teach with a mask. I have a, I don't teach, but I, I decided to teach this summer just to see where they were living. And it's not only that it's hot, it's just that you can, the visual part of talking to kids, uh, we have masks that have a plastic uh, area here in the mouth. And that's it. it's a little better because you can see the kids, but if they don't see your mouth, your gestures, you're missing part of the instruction. So I guess um, what I wanna say with this is that parents that catch up uh, probably, probably uh, will demonstrate in the next two years that they are doing better. Right now, the results that we have, we have a decrease in students attending in our ESL population, a decrease in students attending an increase on the academic level uh, in, the, in the failure. And uh, we are hoping that this next year we're implementing new programs uh, at the high school level and at the elementary level that are gonna help uh, students to catch up with, with, with this increase in the, uh, in the gap. Uh, I also wanted to say regarding the inequities that the technology didn't, didn't help the inequities because uh, you know, not all the kids receive, uh, all the kids receive the same resources, but not all the families were in, 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 the, in the same mood or, oh, I have to actually attend a school year through a computer. Let me wait another week. Let me wait another month. Uh, this is not so important right now. So many families waited to catch up. And many students, like uh, somebody was saying, graduated via online. Uh, or, or in virtual education and they made it and they were not able to register in college on time because of the same situation. They didn't know how to, because as you know, the counselors in schools help do a fantastic job, job in, in counseling them. This is the careers, this is the, uh, they take quizzes about what do you like, where do you wanna go, how the scholarship application. And many students that graduated struggle with that as well. We, we try to, help them be uh, online, but many of them, well, I'm gonna take a sabbatical. Hopefully, like I said, the results are gonna be better than when we see in the paper, but in the paper, uh, the gap widening up um, significantly for our population. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, sorry, Olivia. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Laura. Right, go ahead. Stacey, go ahead. I see your hand raised. <laughs> Okay, so uh, just really quickly, I was going to talk about the inequities just with the devices in and of themselves. Um, students who had to use the district issue Chromebooks could physically couldn't do things that some children who had their own laptops at home could do. Um, even accessing those those children who were at school and using the districts. Um, Wi-Fi or internet, oftentimes when the district's Wi-Fi would, would go out, the kids at home still had access to it and they were still able to do their work. And those children who didn't, who didn't have the resources or, or the availability to be at home missed out on, on instruction or being able to do their work um, inside of class while the other students were not. Sorry, sorry, Olivia. Uh, I think uh, Jen had her hand raised too. Go ahead, Jen. 
I was just going to reiterate and say um, pretty much exactly what Beatrice and Stacey both said in the disabled population as well. So many of our kids, um, you know, with other students, the parent could set them up with their computer or, you know, most of the times kids know computers better than we do at this point too. So they could you know, navigate all of that on their own. But with a lot of the kids with IEPs, that's not something that's in their skill set. And so not only are they missing out on a lot of the therapies that they're needing, but their parents are then required to sit there with them one-on-one -on -one just to navigate the physical functioning of technology. So that poses a bigger challenge too for you know parents that are trying to work from home and try to be the teacher with their student, even if it's they're getting the education through the computer, if the parent is having to sit there and navigate all of the button pushing and all of those sorts of things on the computer, then it's taking that parent away from any time that they would have had to be able to work, even if it is from home. And then, um, you know, if you've got older children that would be able to stay home by themselves and be able to do that, they can't do that in this population either. So I think we will see a bigger divide. I've seen more students this year not completing their goals and the goals are set specifically for them and they're set to be reachable. And this semester specifically, I've seen quite a few that haven't been reached even at like at all. Some of them haven't reached any of their goals. So that's something I haven't typically seen on a very big basis that I have this semester. So I think we will see a difference, unfortunately. Thank you so much. And um, as a reminder, you know, any comments anybody wants to make or questions that y'all have um, for each other or for the folks that we invited to speak tonight, uh, please jump in. Um, and I appreciate those questions very much, Olivia. Thank you. I, I did want to um, ask, you know, Ben, Ben kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but there's so much money, federal money coming into the state for education. Um, the what more than two two billion dollars that you know when it, when you count what's happening at the state level and then at the state and local level, and I wonder whether some of y'all have thought about this a strategy um, for ha having your voices heard um, both at the state and local level in how that uh, money is spent to best address the needs that we really um, saw, have seen during the pandemic, some of which existed before and some of which um, were created by it. So um, are y'all thinking on ways to engage with your um, elected officials and um, engage in that study process to, to make recommendations on how that uh, giant um, pile of money <laughs> is gonna be spent in the best way? Anybody can jump in on that. And if you're not thinking about it yet, I would just encourage you all to do that, <laughs> to think about um, think about ways to engage in that process to make sure uh, that our elected officials hear from people who are parents and, and teachers and education experts to make sure that they're not only hearing from um, folks who uh, might benefit from that, um, from that in a commercial way, we want them to hear from parents and teachers and folks like that too. So um, one of the questions that we have um, is for y'all is um, just, are there changes, and some of y'all have mentioned a few, but are there any other changes that you might mention, might think about um, to teaching or to learning during the pandemic that you want to see continue? Uh, Y'all have touched on a few, but anybody can pipe in on that one. We've ha heard flexibility about testing, which I think is probably um, something that a lot of folks would be would love to see um, continue. And definitely, um, we've heard some comments on. Um, the expansion of broadband, both as a spending that, you know, with that money that's coming in from the feds uh, and also just as a, rem uh, as a reminder of something that we want to see continue is that uh, connectivity. And if, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just, I, I mentioned it, but I just wanna add that 
we have the digital academy is just a continuation of virtual learning in the Little Rural School District is our initiative to continue with that practice. Now we Thank believe you. it's gonna be successful, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I had quite a few things. I was all over the place when you were first asking. I think one of the things that I personally benefited from um, when the governor made the announcement that educate that we were in a state of emergency, telehealth and um, mental health facilities became free. You know, you were able to go see a therapist or a psychologist without having to pay a copay. And I think that as we think about all of the the money that is now here, like the Little Rock School District has $99 million, right? So there are lots of things that we could do with that money to continue those type of services. We could, you know, um, do everything from allocating X amount of, of dollars to go towards minority owned businesses, uh, making the bids come from them. We could partner with mental health professionals to continue those services for free or reduced cost. We could, oh, health insurance right now is a, is a huge thing. We could um, remove or help with the co-pays, not just with teachers, but with the students as well. Um, we, we did a lot with broadband and those hotspots, but one of the things that we did with, um, with learning, hybrid learning or having the, the student remote learning, the students went outside and did lots of teachers, you know, did lots of activities that required them to go outside. So keeping in line with that, we could probably use that money to partner with the art center and museums and that type of stuff to give the students passes that would allow them free entry into those type of places so that they can continue their learning. And so, yeah, so I had just a whole bunch of things like that as to what what the districts and the city and the state could do with all of this money that is a surplus. And I, were you jumping in? Well, yeah. I saw, so I saw him come over here and sit beside me. So I knew he had something to say. Yeah, I, I, I happen to be in a focus group that um, we were looking at all the monies, the CARE Act, the ESSER funds, all of these funds dedicated to uh, education and educators and students. And so uh, it, it, it's ironic. On one hand, they say, you know, we need these monies that are coming in to concentrate on core classes. And, mm -hmm. and, and then the, the next minute they'll say, uh, we need to engage children in mentally healthy activities. And there's nothing more mentally healthier or, or, or more discipline giving than a discipline, which are the fine arts. And so uh, I thought that some of these monies could go toward the fine arts. You have all of these children who have these, these, these innate abilities. And if you allow them uh, the, the, the opportunity to master those and uh, you, you, you get rid of the gang violence and, and, and violence that are happening in the street, the, all the other ills that, that are happening, you provide them with a means to uh, monetize their talent, you uh, uh, educate them because through that artistic education comes other education as well. So I think that's, that, that will take care of uh, both uh, the idle mind, it will take care of the, the, the mentally uh, um, uh, stressed and depressed mind, and it will also um, make you happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Take care of the time, you know, and, and, and it's all within the funds. They allocate that the, these things need to happen. So uh, I think arts would be a great way to make it happen. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, and that was a good reminder from Stacy that, you know, $99 million coming to the Little Rock School District um, and, a, you know, a bunch of the other bigger school districts are really close to that as well. So it's a really powerful um, way that we can all influence and you don't have to call the governor. You can just call, you know, a member of your local school board and make sure that they know that we want this 
uh, spending to help close some of those gaps. And I love the idea of using it not just to close gaps at the student level, but in the business, you know, in the investing in the business community that can help close those racial equity gaps as well. I think that was really um, a really great point. Um, and we had an answer from um, Jacqueline on what can continue. Uh, we saw that in the chat. She said, I think everyone should continue or it should still be an option. Um, since we're still in the middle of the pandemic, parents will still have the ability to communicate as often as needed. I think that's great. Also a great reminder that, you know, we keep thinking like this is done or there's a kind of a, but right now, you know, cases are going up, we have a new variant. And so we, a good reminder, Jacqueline, that we still have a pandemic, uh, active pandemic happening in Arkansas and throughout America and the world. So um, I, we wanted to uh, ask a final question of the group um, before we wrap up, just if anybody wanted to share any hopes that they have for the coming school year, for the 2021-22 school year, what would be your hopes for, uh, for that year and how it will go? If anybody would like to share an answer to that, uh, we would welcome it and then uh, we'll be wrapping up. I'll share mine first, maybe mine, um, mine would be that in what I keep harping on is, the, is that we would uh, use the funds that we have coming to really help um, close those uh, equity gaps that have been exacerbated and, and that we would that we would use best practices and uh, and what the data show are the things that we need to do um, and that we and that uh, that we all will engage that would be my hope for the coming year engage in that process to to have some influence. Anybody else have have one? No worries if not. I do. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Say. I would love to see. Oh, parent, parent, I'm sorry. Um, I would love to see more uh, the parent engagement that we had seen in the last months. Uh, it was forced. It was not voluntary. But now the parents realize that, like Mrs. Uh, Jacqueline was saying. The communication that they received was massive communication. I mean, text, email, telephone calls. They were like, "Man, stop calling me!" And I think that the, that has created a new, a new type of parental engagement. Uh, I have seen PTAs, new PTAs forming in places and in schools that were never they even unthinkable. So uh, we hope that the attendance increases in all levels and in all uh, demographics. Uh, and in all schools, of course, but parental engagement and relationship and attendance to school and community engagements are crucial for the for this school year. The parents have to be involved in the education of the kids. Period. That's the only way that we can be successful. And and and, and is is good enough uh, 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 to to repeat? I was trying to get the pronunciation of your name right. Uh, Beatrice, but I have seen you multiple times and you know me probably. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and, and so parental involvement, my hope would be that this experience, this year and a half that we've had in the past and possible, uh, you know, whatever we have this fall will, will empower and engage them to be involved in, in education on multiple levels, like you're saying with politics and the money, with, with, with their child in the school, engaged in a lesson, maybe they, they, they see what the curriculum is now and have opinions about that. P parents, you have the power. So uh, please be involved. And, and, and think on the level, think at the level of communication was between the parents and maybe the principal or maybe the secretary. During the pandemic, the communication was between the teacher and the student. And believe me, if they need a translation, there was an app that was translated for them. But the communication was a streamlined between the teacher and the educator. And there is no more crystal and pristine communication than that one because there was not a third party saying, I think that you, the teacher meant to say there was not. The teacher was telling the parent A, B, C, and the parent get the, the, the A, B, C that the teacher was saying. So yes, and with you, parental involvement 100%. And I, I guess for me, my hope would be that, um, that teachers have more, vo more voice and that they are respected more. 
I would also hope, like when you guys were talking about parental involvement, I think going back to all of this money that that's there, I think what happened or part of what happened with the, that increased parental involvement was the flexibility that a lot of employers offered to their staff. They allowed them the opportunity to, yeah. to work from home and to do modified schedules. So if we could find a way to help companies have the money or the resources to be able to, to still pay their employees that would then allow them time to take off, to go to these conferences, to be involved in the schools, I think that would help because a lot of my parents don't attend because they cannot afford to take off of work. So we have all this money, let's, let's figure out how to partner with the businesses so that that is not an additional barrier that my parents have. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, you know, in our work, we're often encouraged to um, have some kind of compensation for people to take part in things. So we get more uh, folks from all uh, walks of life um, to participate. So that, yeah, that's a really good, uh, really great idea. And um, thanks for the, those comments about engagement, um, both at the parental and uh, teacher level, but also like you say, at, in the community level as well, engagement um, is what we need. And is that, uh, Casey, um, did you unmute yourself? Is that, if I've got the right person who's on the phone, I can't remember now, <laughs> it's been too long. Yeah, yeah that's me. Yeah, go ahead, Casey. Thank um, you. Um, my hope would be, um, just like you all have said, that we all will stay engaged and have a voice and be an advocate for the kids. And, you know, like I said, we, we could talk about it on the phone and talk about it on these Zoom calls. But like I said, we have to advocate and talk to our local officials and, and our policymakers and our policyholders so that they can be good stewards of the money that has come down so that we can put these programs in place and so that we can do the things that we need to do. So my hope is that we don't get stagnant and just stay still, but be a voice, get busy on what we need to do to help our kids get to that next level. That's right, thank you. It's on us, isn't it? To, to make sure that our voices are heard. And as Mr. McAdoo says, that we have power uh, on so many levels at the individual level and at the community level when we do that. So um, that's a great point to end on. Thank you so much, Casey. And uh, good luck with your coming school year in El Dorado. And uh, to all of you, um, thank you so much to uh, our invited speakers and uh, for your great comments uh, to all of you who who have joined us. Um, uh, and uh, Jacqueline says, let us know um, how we can help you. I think that that's really great uh, reminder. You know, our work at Arkansas Advocates only works uh, when we're engaging the community and we're engaging people statewide to really raise their voices to be part of this process. And so uh, we will be, I know that Rebecca will be following up with y'all with some um, information and a link to the recording and that kind of thing. So we, you can share it with folks. Um, and uh, make sure, and we'll, and making sure that we're you're on our lists and everything to make, to uh, stay engaged in these discussions because um, it really is on us over the next uh, year, two years, to make sure uh, we're all good stewards of the funding coming and that we spend it in a way that actually makes a difference for kids. So, um, Rebecca, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I, I appreciate everyone so much for joining the call today and, and all the great comments. It was a really great conversation. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can take this, this conversation out and spread it around with other people and, and make sure that every, I think a lot of people don't even know that all this money is coming to the state and the impact that it could have. So um, let everyone you know know. Um, and thank you again. Have a great evening. And I hope to talk with you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Good night.